most Christians today in, in just about every denomination will are familiar that there's a seven year period that's coming in the future and, and are fine with accepting that. We believe that there's a seven year period that is described in scripture that is regarding future events. And they, most people will call the seven year period the tribulation or the great tribulation. And that's a misnomer, but that's what it's commonly known as. Um, and they'll accept that there is tribulation, that there's great tribulation that's going to happen. Okay, this isn't, those two things, a seven year period and, and a great tribulation, everyone agrees on that, for, by and large. Right? I know there's outliers and everything, but, but by and large, most people will accept that. However, if you ask most people where the Bible explains this, they won't have any idea. They've just heard it repeated over and over again, and, and it's real solid. Oh, yeah, no, there's a there's the tribulation. But if you were to ask them, well, hey, where does the Bible actually teach that? Even just give me the book of the Bible that teaches that. Most people have no clue. They won't know about the book of Daniel. They won't know about Matthew. They won't know about 1st or 2nd Thessalonians. You know, they're not going to, I mean, maybe Revelation would be their first guess. Right? I mean, that would be for someone who knows anything about the Bible. They'd just be like, well, I don't know, Revelation, if you're just taking a stab at it. But they wouldn't be able to tell you where that is. And actually, where we get the seven-year period from primarily comes from the book of Daniel. And I'm going to show that to you tonight. But the reason why I'm even mentioning this and bringing it up is because people can have some very strongly held beliefs on things that they don't really know that well personally. They've just been taught it over and over again and just kind of accepted the things that they've heard without either doing their own studying or hearing other views or, or just, you know, allowing the Bible to teach you what it says. Now, very, very clearly, again, if we're just taking this, this passage as we read it, let's look at verse number one in Matthew 24. The Bible reads, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So they come out of the temple and his disciples are, hey, look, look at the buildings of the temple, right? L look at how great they are, or look how beautiful, whatever they're saying. They're, they're pointing Jesus to look at the temple to which, or to the buildings of the temple, to which Jesus responds unto them in verse two. And Jesus said to them, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So he's saying, you know, you're marveling at this, at these buildings. It's all going to be knocked down. It's all going to be destroyed. So it's kind of like, what's the point about marveling over a building, right? He's just saying it's all going to be knocked down. Verse number three. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and, and this is where, you know, in theological terms, whatever, people talk about the Olivet Discourse. This is the passage that they're talking to because he's sitting, it's, you know, it's a fancy term. Basically, he's at the Mount of Olives. And discourse is because he's teaching them, right? So he's, he's given them a, a little sermon on the Mount of Olives. And this is known uh, historically as the Olivet Discourse. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be? Now, this is important to you because when he comes to them, when they come to him privately and he's teaching, we see in other passages in scripture, we've already gone over this, where when Jesus is teaching publicly, he's teaching in parables, he's using some dark sayings, and in some cases he's saying, you know what, the reason why I'm teaching in parables is because it's not given for them to know of the secret things of God. It's not for them to know, but for you it is to be known. So he gives the parables to the public at large, but when he's talking to his disciples, he talks to them close and, and personally, he goes in and expounds and explains all the meanings of the parables and goes into much, much deeper context. So just the fact that, he, that, it, that the Bible is being careful, that this record here that Matthew gives us is telling us, hey, they're asking him privately right away is going gonna, is gonna to signal he's not going to just be speaking to them in these dark sayings. He's revealing, he's going to reveal truth unto them. Okay? Not that he's not revealing truth unto anyone he talks to, but he's really going to go into more detail with them as opposed to just the public at large. Okay. So they come and ask, they hear what he said about one stone not being left upon another. They say, hey, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? So they know that he's going to come back. I mean, they're, they're asking, he's right there with them. So what do you mean of thy coming? Of his second coming. When he comes again, they're asking, when, 
what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? This is the question. These are the questions they're asking. Now, Jesus answers all of these things. So when shall these things be? One stone being left upon another. I believe there's multiple things being answered here because they ask, well, they ask a few different questions, even if they don't fully realize that it's not all one thing. When the temple is destroyed, that's in like 70 AD. And Jesus gives information on that. But then they also ask, what about your coming and of the end of the world as well? And he gives information about that as well. Now, <laughs> this should go without saying that if you want to know about the signs of Jesus' second coming and of the end of the world, if you, if you just, with, with no other teaching, no other people trying to tell you anything, if you wanted to know about something like that, wouldn't you go to a place in Scripture where the question is asked to Jesus Christ himself? I mean, doesn't that alone just kind of make sense as a starting point and say, I want to know when Jesus is coming back. I want to know what it's going to be like when, when the end of the world is nearing. Well, why don't we go to that question and answer session with Jesus Christ himself, Matthew chapter 24. Amen. And I would say this, if you have some teaching that's going to contradict this very clear question and answer, your teaching is wrong. It's just, it's just flat out wrong. But let's, let's keep going here. Look at verse number four. And Jesus answered and said unto them, very first thing he answers with, take heed that no man deceive you. Don't let anybody trick you. Don't let anybody deceive you in this. Why? Because there's a lot of deception that's going to go on, especially regarding future events. Lots of deception. 